Good morning, this is Terry. Uh, most of you know me, uh, Reverend Terry Stewart with uh, Queen Anne Baptist Church, and I'm a minister to incarcerated youth. And in that role, I am on the nonprofit Circle Faith Future, and I organize Youth Rise, which is our um, program that works with incarcerated youth, organizing their religious and spiritual connections uh, while they're in these institutions that are very uh, unreligious and unspiritual. So this morning, I am hopeful to bring to you a reaction video uh, in the way of YouTube um, style, if you've ever seen reaction videos on YouTube, that is reaction to Mentor Washington's uh, various trainings that they did during their two-day conference that they recently had. Um, I can't share with you the videos directly because they're not, I'm not able to download them, but I believe that I'm able to react to them and share in this way. So this is an entirely new um, technology to me, and I hope uh, you will bear with me as we go through this. couple tips. You can... Um, Fast, uh, you can increase the speed that the videos play. If you think we're all talking too slowly, you can go and adjust the speed to 1.25 or 1.5 or even double speed. I believe that nobody could listen to me at double speed because I talk fast enough as it is. So, uh, but do, do what you need to do to help you get through this uh, about hour long um, reaction video. So uh, this video is a reaction to the keynote opener from Dr. Chan Hellman, who is a professor from Oklahoma who uh, studies the science of hope, which is interesting to me because the first, my first idea about my um, doctorate in demon doctor in ministry was going to be looking at the science of hope there's a thing called the children's hope index but at my university that i was at you have to entice a faculty member so a theologian into being interested in the same topics that you're interested in and there just wasn't a lot of people interested in hope at that time so i set it aside and uh, left that university, went to Gonzaga to work on my PhD. But having rediscovered this, it really calls me back to pondering what is the science of hope? How do we bring hope to the youth that we work with? I have always described mentors as carriers of hope. Then we carry that hope until our mentees are strong enough to carry hope on their own. All right, so I'm going to figure out how to get this on a split screen so that we can see the video and you can see me at the same time. Hopefully this will work and I look forward to um, doing this. Let's see, share a screen to see how this looks. Okay. Let's see, shift seven. Hmm. Of course, it is not as easy as it, I think it should be. Let's see. Hmm. go. So I should be in a little box down at the bottom and you should see a kind of a grayed out version of Dr. Hellman. I'm going to get this started. Let's go with a reaction. Technology doesn't seem to work well for me and so Laura has graciously uh, offered to uh, run the slides uh, for me. So uh, with that, I mean, the truth is technology can drive us all crazy, right? That, uh, Laura, we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. Laura is Laura Mendoza of Mentor Washington. She's in charge of all the training. Okay. Not sure you can 
see the screen. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so um, real quickly, um, again, my name is Chan Hillman. Um, and for about the last 20 years, um, I, as a professor at the University of Oklahoma, um, my work has really been focused on measuring the outcomes and impact of program services on client well-being. Um, so really working in spaces like uh, domestic violence, child maltreatment, homelessness, food insecurity, uh, et cetera. Um, and so really that's been my passion uh, is to partner with community organizations and help them to develop the evidence that's necessary for advocacy of programs, uh, for fundraising, uh, but also for program improvement and program development purposes. So we'll go ahead to the, to the next slide. And um, uh, roughly uh, 15 years ago, um, I was invited uh, by an organization here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, to conduct a housing needs assessment. Um, and go ahead and click uh, uh, through uh, the screen, just a couple of those. There you go. Thank you. Um, and this organization provides services to individuals living with HIV and AIDS. And the clients uh, that are receiving services uh, are also experiencing pretty extreme uh, adversity, such as poverty um, and, and really all of the things that come along, uh, the difficulties that come along with that. And it was during this meeting that I was actually introduced to the concept of hope. And so I like to really give honor to a young man named David, uh, who's the one who really introduced me uh, to this concept. Uh, David uh, was 19 years old and a client of this organization, and he and I had about a seven-minute conversation, very informal, and David shared with me that three months earlier, he learned that he was HIV positive. Now, when David shared this with me, the first thing that came to my mind as a psychologist, uh, but also as a program evaluator, is this question of what's wrong with you? Because given the adversity that he's experienced, it's really natural uh, for those of Just an interruption, this idea of what's wrong with you sometimes seems embedded in the ACEs, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences, which has now turned into PACEs, and the P has to do with resiliency, so that the Adverse Childhood Experiences is held in balance with resiliency practices. So it's not so much about what's wrong with you, but using trauma and trauma-informed care as a tool to be able to recognize the resiliency, and here I think the hope that is within each person before us. Of us in the uh, helping professions to really lean into the idea of if you're experiencing this adversity, you know, is there the possibility of depression, anxiety, uh, dysregulation, et cetera? Um, because as a psychologist, I was trained that if I can identify these adversities, uh, such as depression, and reduce those uh, uh, adversities, that that's really how we treat well-being, that the reduction of depression is the outcome of programs. David further shared with me in conversation that two weeks earlier, he had disclosed to his parents that he was HIV positive, and they uh, kicked him out of the house, and he had spent those last two weeks homeless in downtown Tulsa. Um, and so now I'm really paying attention to um, social isolation and just really the difficulties of trying to navigate uh, being a homeless youth uh, in an urban environment. Um, but David did something uh, in that moment that, again, changed my life both personally and professionally. David shared with me that he had enrolled at the local community college. So during those two weeks while he was navigating being homeless, he had also made an appointment with an academic counselor. He had made his way to the campus. He had enrolled in his first semester of courses, declared a major, and was ready to move forward with his life. And it just really struck me uh, in that moment that I had spent my entire professional career focused on this question of what's wrong with you. And uh, go ahead and click a couple of times. Uh, and what David helped me understand is that there's probably a better question. And that is 
this question about what's right with you. And this was really my introduction to a real strengths focused uh, perspective of not only navigating through trauma and adversity, but also the way in which program services nurture and restore hope uh, in clients being served. Um, so again, this was my introduction and I always uh, try to give a little bit of honor to David uh, for introducing me to this life-changing uh, concept. So we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, you, you all are much more familiar with the adverse childhood experience than uh, we are in Oklahoma. This is something that is really emerging here. Um, in Oklahoma, I've been very fortunate that our governor and first lady have really uh, created a hope-centered initiative where uh, the task... Wouldn't it be amazing to have our governor create a hope-centered state government, like have everything be put through the lens of hope? I was thinking of what that would look like in all of the agencies in Washington, and I think that's amazing. Asked by the governor, uh, he publicly announced during his State of the State address that Oklahoma is going to become a hope-centered state based upon this work. And part of that was born out of the sort of awareness and understanding that has been taking place uh, around the long-term impact of, and the, the high prevalence of this adverse childhood experience. So let's go to the next slide um, real quickly. And I just wanna share with you some of the spaces that we've been doing uh, this work. And go ahead and, um, yeah, a couple more, there you go. Thank you. And so what I want to share with you is that um, at the national level, uh, the Center for Disease Control every few years does a, a nationally representative study um, and looking really at the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences. And nationally, that average is a 1.61. So I'm so I don't think you can see, but down at the very bottom of this slide, it has foster children and they're at 5.68 for adverse childhood experiences. And that's on a scale of 10, so that's huge. I'm a, a lead researcher on a project um, for children exposed to domestic violence. So children roughly in uh, 30 states, about 3,000 youth. And uh, for children participating in these programs, uh, you can see that their average A score is significantly higher than the national average. Uh, in just a little while, I'll show you some of the hope intervention uh, that we've been using with these uh, with these youth. Uh, you can also see that uh, adjudicated youth uh, also have a high rate of uh, exposure, uh, as well as foster youth. So this is foster youth in the state of Oklahoma. Um, our Oklahoma Department of Human Services, uh, which also has our child welfare programs, um, has been fuel it, fully infused around hope for the past three and a half years. So we've trained all 6,000 uh, employees at the, the Department of Human Services. And one of the programs that we're specifically focused on is that our foster youth who are aging out of the system. So these are youth between the ages of 14 and 17. And in our uh, work uh, in this program, this is the average A score for our youth in Tulsa. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and use the chat function for a moment. Um, and what I'd like for you to do is just estimate, uh, uh, in your own opinion, what would you estimate is the average number of placements uh, that a foster youth uh, is experiencing uh, who is between the ages of 14 and 17? By and large, when I was in this live the first time, the uh, most, the number that most people put in was between four and five, maybe six. So what do you think that number is? And so I'll just ask you to put that in the chat if you, uh, if you have a chance. Um, and while you're typing that in, uh, what I'll share with you is that we've become embedded in our foster uh, youth program by creating these hope-centered case management plans. Um, and these hope-centered case management plans are really utilizing the goal-setting strategies uh, around 
uh, the various domains of a foster youth's life. So housing, employment, education, relationships, uh, and leisure. And fortunately, we've been working with an advisory group of foster youth who is might be really interesting for the mentors to create goal settings for each of those domains that he just listed, like housing, relationship, and community, all of those things. It's on the team helping us navigate this. So as you're all typing in uh, your estimate for the average number of placements, what I will tell you is that in Oklahoma, uh, foster youth between the ages of 14 and 17 have experienced on average 22 different placements. Are you as gobsmacked as I am? 22. And so I want you to reflect on uh, how that can impact a youth with regards to that consistent relationship that they need with adults. Consistent relationships uh, that are needed to help promote hope and to nurture well-being. And so uh, it's not that necessarily our system is broken. It can clearly be improved. But if a child goes into foster care, let's say at the age of eight, and moves a couple of times a year, um, it's pretty easy to see that those average numbers can increase uh, very quickly, quite frankly. And so these are the spaces that we're really paying attention to. How do we nurture hope um, among youth um, where the state is the parent? So, okay, we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> So um, what I'm really interested in as it relates to the adverse childhood experience, uh, among other things, uh, other forms of adversity, is not so much the adversity itself, but rather how it impacts the way we relate with each other. I'm much more interested in how these adversities show up. So when a, when a youth that you're working with has experienced a tremendous number of adversities, how has hope been robbed in their life? And these are some of the trauma responses. I usually call this the desecration of hope, but I like hope being robbed also because it's, it's true. Associated with the adverse childhood experience. So for instance, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that one of our uh, publications demonstrates that when youth experience one or more of these adverse childhood experience, they report significantly lower levels of trust in professionals. So what I want you to hear from that statement is that they report significantly lower levels of trust in you. And so if I don't trust you, then how does that impact the way I relate, the way I communicate? And so it, it really highlights the importance of nurturing and developing a trusting caring relationship. And one of the things that we've learned in our research is that hope is a social gift. That is, hope happens in relationship. So again, you can see... I want to say that again. Hope happens in relationship. Some of the different areas that we focus in on uh, in our research in terms of how those adversities can increase things like rumination, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, uh, et cetera. And those really quickly, rumination is that, you know, negative tape playing over and over and over again in your mind. You just ruminate or attaching to that wound. Those things then reduce our capacity uh, for hope. So we'll go to the, to the next slide. Um, as we increase our awareness and understanding of the adverse childhood experience and certainly uh, promotes a framework like trauma-informed care, for instance, um, it really drives a question. So trauma-informed care is the framework or the foundation that promotes hope. That's what we're going for. ...that we all tend to have as we increase our awareness and understanding, and that is, what do we do about it? And the work that uh, we've been doing at the Hope Research Center and in partnership with uh, many of the organizations in Washington is we believe that hope is what we do about that, that hope provides a framework for action. Hope provides that framework to help uh, us navigate through uh, the adversities that we might experience. What I want you to hear, if you've never heard me speak before, 
Um, what I want you to hear is that for us, hope is not the outcome. Hope is the process and well-being is always the outcome that we're Hope is the process and well-being is the outcome. Perfect. Couldn't say it better. We're interested in. So I'm going to ask you to use the chat function again in just a moment. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and what I'm going to ask you um, when the next slide pops up is just to answer this question. So as you think about this concept of hope, what comes to mind? What do you associate with this word hope? Um, what do you associate with the word hope? And again, just, just type that into uh, the chat function. And uh, I'm also going to ask. So for me, hope is the belief that you can accomplish your goals and the ability to get that done. Ask you a, a follow up question. So uh, don't stray too far away from uh, from your keyboard. And hopefully those terms will show up. So usually things that we hear uh, when we ask the question, uh, when you think of hope, what do you associate that with? Um, oftentimes we'll hear things like positivity, um, the future, um, optimism, for instance. Oh, I like that, Stacy. Thank you. Peace um, in, in that. Um, this idea that uh, something can be different uh, is another uh, type of uh, comment. Um, and then, you know, as we continue to think of all of those reasons are why I like to think of mentors as carriers of hope until our youth are strong enough to carry hope for themselves is because so many of our youth cannot imagine their future. So they don't really have the capacity to project themselves into the future to think about what are those precious goals that they might want to create and to live a life that lives up to those goals. It takes a long time of working with mentors and with staff for youth to kind of clear out the garbage that has obstructed their ability to hope. Um, to recreate hope and to remove that desecration. Uh, and I, I like to think of that uh, in those terms because hope to me is a sacred um, experience, a sacred process. So desecration, when people rain down on uh, a youth's ability to hope and remove that ability to hope, it is a desecration. It is uh, removing the sacred from their lives. About this idea of hope, one of the things that I'd ask you to consider is, is hope a feeling? Is it an emotion that we have? Or is hope a way of thinking? Um, and so oftentimes people will say, well, maybe it's a little bit of both. But I think it's really important for us to understand at the very beginning of this conversation that for all of the work that we do, the science of hope is the idea that hope is a cognitive process. It is a mindset. Now, if hope was an emotion, then at best we'd be able to help people manage those emotions. But because hope is a way of thinking, and here is the critical takeaway, because hope is a way of thinking, we know it can be taught. We know it is something that can be taught. And the work that we've been doing for three and four year olds in uh, pre-K programs all the way across the lifespan, we know that we can nurture and restore hope. And so we can nurture and restore hope, amen? In fact, um, our research and some published research by other scholars demonstrate that we can see a statistically significant increase in hope in about one hour, in about one hour's worth of intention. One hour, it's amazing. Work. So let's go ahead and uh, click uh, forward. Uh, this is the definition uh, for hope, and that is hope is the belief that the future will be better than today and that we have the power to make it so. So the importance about this definition is how hope is different than optimism. So if we look at hope is the belief that the future will be better than today, if that was the definition, that really... 
Hope is belief plus power or action, right? So belief and action. So it's not just belief bracketed on its own. Is optimism. But hope goes beyond optimism through the latter part of that definition that we have the power to make it so. So let's go to the next slide um, and um, click it. Uh, there, well, there you go, one more time. So the interesting thing about hope is that it's made up of these three simple components. That is um, goals, pathways, and willpower. Now, goals are the cornerstone of everything that we do around hope. And this is based upon the psychological concept that each and every one of us are goal driven. That is from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed, each and so the mentor's job really is to help develop the pathways and to strengthen the youth's agency. Every one of us are pursuing goals in our life, whether in the short term or long term. The question with hope is whether or not we have the ability to identify the pathways or the strategies that we're going to use to pursue those goals. Pathways thinking is the strategizing piece of hope. Uh, it also includes that problem solving, being able to identify barriers and to navigate through that. The final piece of hope, willpower, is the word that I'm going to use. Uh, the correct psychological term is agency. Um, but I'm working, at least in Oklahoma, with 111 state agencies. Uh, we're in Virginia, Iowa, Washington. Um, and a host of other states. Um, and I prefer to use the word willpower because we don't confuse um, where you work or your agency uh, with this psychological term. But willpower is really the mental energy that is required to focus on those pathway pursuits. So it's really about your ability to focus your attention and intention in pursuing your goals. Goals, pathways, attention and intention pathways and willpower now what i really love about this concept is its simplicity it's really a simple concept to understand so let's go to the next slide <clears throat> excuse me um and click it uh one more there you go now what's important to know is that when we think about the word hope and we know that it's based upon goals pathways and willpower it's important to understand that to be hopeful, we have to have both the pathways and the willpower uh, to pursue those pathways. You have to have both. So it might be that I have a lot of desire for a particular outcome, that I really have a lot of mental energy towards uh, some goal that I have. But if I don't know how to get there from here, then I would actually be lower in hope. Now, alternatively, it might be that I have the pathways. Um, let's imagine, let's say, a, a middle-aged school child who lays their head down on a desk in a classroom. If they would just study, if they would read the chapter, join a study group, work with a tutor, all of which are pathways to achieving good grades. But if that youth doesn't have the willpower, the desire, the mental energy that's required to do that work, I like the phrase mental energy because it, it really points towards what else is happening in a youth's life that might drain that mental energy. You would once again classify that as lower hope. Now, two things occurred to me when I first started thinking about hope, and this is one of the first things that I did. Uh, you might be able to see behind me, I have a real chalkboard. And when I first started thinking about hope, I drew uh, this graph on my chalkboard. Uh, and what I started to realize is that this language of hope is really the perfect description of the work that each and every one of you are doing. That this language of hope is one of the best descriptions of the community programs that we have. Mm -hmm. That each and every one of your programs have goals and that you uh, as a mentor or you as a program are a pathway to those goals. Each and every one of you are pathways of hope for the youth that you mentor. You are a pathway of hope. 
the question is really about generating and supporting the willpower. So that was my first big takeaway was this, this idea that I think that it's a really good description of that work. The second thing that occurred to me was that this is a different way of thinking about hope than I was used to. So we might, for instance, in everyday conversation, make comments like, I hope you're well. I hope you have a great day. In Oklahoma, we uh, experience tornadoes pretty frequently. So you might hear us say things like, oh, I hope there are no tornadoes today. In fact, at uh, four o'clock this afternoon, we're supposed to have severe weather uh, once again in Tulsa. And so uh, when those storms come around, my willpower is going to really get generated in focusing on those storms. But what I have to realize is that I have no pathways. I have no way to control that weather. So one more click, please, Laura. So we have to understand the distinction between hoping and wishing. So we just a real quick note. I mean, imagine the pathways that are removed from youth's lives, the youth that we encounter, um, the normal pathways that some of us take for granted that may not be available for the youth. Some of that might be economics, um, community, family. Those things greatly affect the pathways available to us. Wishing is when we have a desire for an outcome, but there's really nothing that we can do. There's no strategies by which to pursue that. So wishing becomes passive towards the goals that we desire. And it's important to understand that hope is about taking action to pursue that future. A very important distinction. Okay, let's go to the, to the next slide. Um, so go ahead and click one more. So I wanna share with you real quickly uh, some of the things that we're learning about how trauma and adversity influence goals pathways and willpower. And one of the first things that we discovered was how when you and I experience distress uh, or high levels of stress, the way it impacts the way we think of the future. And what we found is that when children and adults are experiencing distress, we are much more likely to set goals that are avoidant mm -hmm. in nature. Now, this is really important because imagine a bad I think if we think of this as fight, flight, or freeze, so this is that freeze response as avoidant behavior. Basketball player who steps out on a court, and the mindset is, I want to get the ball and shoot the winning shot for the team. That is an achievement mindset. But if that same basketball player steps out on the court and the mindset is, I hope they don't throw me the ball because I'm probably going to lose it and really disappoint my team. That's an avoidant mindset. And really what I want you to focus on is how those two basketball players behave on the court. And you can see that the nature of our goals drives our pathways thinking. Mm -hmm. So as an example, for all of us, when the pandemic first hit, we transitioned to remote work. Uh, we started to spend uh, that time at home. And the primary reason for that transition was so that we could avoid exposure to um, the virus. Now, avoiding exposure to the virus is a very good goal. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what I want you to understand is where does that come from? And that avoidant framework is most likely coming from fear and uncertainty. So we don't want to stay there. So that was the first thing we found. So go ahead and click it. Uh, uh, go ahead and click twice. Yeah. So what we've also found, and this is true more so with youth, um, is what we found is that exposure to that adversity uh, really starts to deplete the pathways thinking, the, the ability to understand the roadmaps that are necessary to pursue our goal. What we've also found is that youth who have experienced a lot of adversity, when they first hit a barrier, uh, they are much more likely to shut down. They're much more likely to quit in their goal pursuits. The final thing that I want to highlight, and I think this is especially true in a mentoring type of relationship, uh, but what the research shows is that um, 
uh, willpower is drained by fear and rumination. And in particular, what we know um, is that our willpower, the willpower that you and I have, is very limited. It is a finite resource. And that throughout the day, we might experience mental exhaustion, for instance. That's the depletion of willpower. Now, unfortunately, what the research shows is that when our willpower is depleted, so too is our self-regulation. That, that is, self-regulation is highly associated with willpower. So when our willpower is depleted, we are much more likely to be impulsive, have difficulty controlling our emotions, uh, et cetera. The final thing I'll, I'll share with you about willpower that is really fascinating is the idea that our willpower is associated with the glucose in our blood. Now, glucose, as you know, is sugar. So sugar is good for you. You heard it here. Sugar, but it is our energy source. What I really want you to hear is that nutrition matters. It totally does. And I'm joking about sugar, but you get my point. Nutrition is a critical aspect of nurturing hope. So thinking about this idea of uh, snacks and the type of snacks, uh, et cetera, uh, become very important. So let's go to the next slide. This reminds me of the HALT response. If you um, have someone who is kind of in the midst of um, a reaction, HALT is hunger, anger, loneliness, and tiredness. So if you check those things and how they influence willpower or the uh, ability to move out of a um, fear or rumination response. HALT, H-A-L-T, hunger, anger, loneliness, and tiredness. Um, and what I want you to consider is, and go ahead, there you go, um, is to consider what is the opposite of hope. And uh, let me interject. So going back to HALT, sorry about this, is that if you have a youth before you that's in a active emotional dysregulation or self-dysregulation, you can help them assess if they are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And then you can help them see that their emotional or uh, self-dysregulation is a response to being in one of those four states. And it may not be true that they're in one of those four states, but it helps eliminate things. And if they are like hungry, then maybe you can help them seek out a snack that is available to them in their cottage. Uh, traditionally, the most common response that we get is despair. So let's go to the next slide. In the science of hope, one, there you go. In the science of hope, what we know is that uh, the loss of hope is actually a process um, that starts with anger, frustration, and anxiety. But despair is not the opposite of hope. In fact, apathy is the opposite of hope. And apathy- So how many kids do we have that say that they don't care? Is when I look at a goal or a particular pathway, and my mindset is no matter what I do, I'm going to fail. So why try? Apathy is where we give up. And so despair is still an important part of hope because I have the willpower, the mental energy towards a goal that I cannot have. Um, and the problem with despair is when it transitions into desperation. So in desperation, we can begin to take on pathways uh, that are potentially dysfunctional. How many youth do we work with that are in states of desperation when they uh, go out and do whatever it is that they did? And that's not saying all of them are, but a few of them are in that state of despair there. They need food for their family or whatever it is. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so just to show you the association between uh, hope and the adverse childhood experience, the blue bars represent zero ACEs, so youth with a, uh, an A score of zero. And you can see that on the high hope side, in the, uh, that they're much more likely to score higher uh, on hope. And the um, orange slide uh, is youth with an A score of one or higher. So you can 
So about 60% of youth who have a score of zero have a high hope. You can see that uh, the impact that ACE has. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, one more. And this is uh, taken directly from your Healthy Youth Survey. Um, and so looking at, uh, I believe this last data collection included 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th uh, with regard to the HOPE assessment. But what we see is that, uh, for instance, uh, youth who report no or low HOPE, uh, roughly 67% of them also report depression. So you can see the connection then between lower levels of hope um, and higher rates of depression. Let's go to the next slide. Very similar pattern uh, for suicidal ideation. So again, we know that uh, hope uh, becomes this protective factor. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. The good news is uh, we know that we can teach hope. We know how to do this process. And we've actually uh, developed and tested curriculum uh, on how to nurture and restore hope for both youth uh, and adults. Um, I wanna get my hands on that curriculum somehow without paying a lot of money for it. And this is really going to be the focus of, um, I believe I'll be out uh, in Washington working with many of the uh, different agencies to really start leaning into this process. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I wanna show you kind of the simplicity of uh, developing strategies around hope. And it starts with this idea of goal setting. Remember, we're driven by the goals that we have. What I also want you to recognize is that programs tend to have their own goals. And as part of that, we begin to treat programs uh, or program activities as the goal rather than the pathway that it actually is for the goals that the youth have. So what I'm going to advocate for very strongly is giving voice and choice to the youth and the families in identifying what are the goals they desire. This idea of voice and choice for the youth is in the perfect alignment with the research for incarcerated youth, which shows that mentors and youth that co-create goals together for each session that they do and for life have a much better outcome than if a mentor comes in with their own goals and tries to put that onto the youth, or if a youth comes in with their own goals and tries to put that onto the mentor. It's this sweet spot of co-creation, or earlier we said hope, uh, is rooted in relationship. So it's that relationship of what you do together. And what are the strategies uh, that we can begin to develop and work towards in the pursuit of their goals? So let's go to the next slide. So I want to show you real quickly um, some outcomes that we have for these uh, curriculum. Um, this is working with uh, a, a group of youth and in partnership uh, with both Boys and Girls Clubs and uh, YMCA, just summer camp programs uh, that are in most of our communities. Um, and this was actually a program uh, in collaboration uh, with those two uh, other programs, Boys and Girls Club and YMCA. What I want you to hear is that this was not a therapeutic intervention. This was integrating the science of hope into the existing programs uh, of those two uh, camps. So let's go to the next uh, slide. So the youth basically learn uh, goal setting and pathways development as part of the conversations. So we measure hope um, about 30 days before uh, the camp starts, the last day and the 30-day follow-up. So you can see the statistically significant increase in hope. But remember, hope is not the outcome. So if you'll look at the difference between the pre-test and the post-test, which is roughly two points, and what we actually found in this research is that two-point increase in hope predicted a letter grade change in the classroom. That's the power of hope that's where we begin to see the positive outcomes. Now, the other thing, and I'm gonna have to move forward because I'm gonna run out of time. 
So hope can take your D student to a C, which opens up so many pop, uh, avenues of success in academia. But the other thing that I want to really point out on that is that we didn't go from low hope to high hope. Those youth at pretest scored on average in the slight hope category. And that two point increase simply means it's slightly higher hope. And that slight moving of the needle produced a letter grade change in the classroom. So we just have to begin the journey. So in this slide, it provides kind of a roadmap of how we begin to do hope work. And that right here is what uh, we can do as mentors, like introduce hope, do goal setting, identify pathways, help nurture willpower, problem solve the obstacles, create for them their own hope map, and then readdressing goals at, after you've done that entire process. That is introducing the language, understanding what it is and then beginning to lean in on strategies of goal setting and pathways development. Uh, many of you have already are already doing these kinds of things. Uh, I think that hope is one of the best descriptors of the work that you already do. What I'm advocating for us is to begin to think about programs and think about the way in which you interact with youth very intentionally through the lens of hope, goals, pathways and willpower. And we'll go to the next slide, which will be my last one, and then I will do some Q&A. And really when we begin to think about hope is, is really at that point where um, we begin to recognize the way things are right now in our lives. But when we can begin to imagine the possibilities of what could be, that is when hope is born. So uh, click it one more time. And then I'll go ahead and uh, stop talking and see if there are any questions, which for me as a speaker, this is the big fear that there will be no questions. I can. Awesome. So there is one question here. Um, how are hope and resilience differentiated I, or connected? I love that question. I love that question. And I am uh, I'm still wrestling with it. Um, I've published, I think, three or four scientific papers on it. If you're familiar with uh, PACE's connection, um, it used to be ACE's connection. PACE's connection is a website that you can go to to get this uh, connection of resilience and adverse childhood experiences. Um, in PACE's connection, uh, I've actually written a few blogs on, uh, on that question. Um, so what we find uh, very repeatedly is that when, when we look at hope and... Really quickly, I'm going to share this website. So you should see the PACES Connection uh, website that has a lot of information that you can go to on your own. In particular outcomes for children and adults, we see both a significant positive uh, relationship between hope and those outcomes and resilience and those outcomes. But very consistently in every single study, when we have both hope and resilience in the predictive model, hope always is the most significant and, and strongest predictor of well being. Now, the, the difficulty with resilience is that it has many different definitions, and everybody kind of has their own way of doing it, which makes it really difficult for an evaluator uh, to really look at an evidence-based model. And HOPE provides that very simplistic framework for action. We know from the resilience literature that every child needs a positive adult in their life. And what I'm arguing is that HOPE tells you how to do it. It's goals, pathways, and willpower. So here's my final statement to that wonderful question. And that is, HOPE is the mindset that drives resilient behaviors. I'm going to stop right there. I uh, 
If you've made it this far, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Uh, I think this discussion of hope from this keynote gives you a great framework for how you as a mentor can go and meet with individual youth and help uh, youth identify pathways and strengthen their willpower by just being with them. Remember it said even with with just one hour with youth, you can make a difference. That's not to say you're gonna turn around their whole life, but even one hour of time is a, a good use of time. So just so you know, the program goals of Circle Faith Future, our organization, is to bring hope to a fractured world. That's the overall goals for Circle Faith Future. And then for Youth Rise in particular, it is to have hope filled mentors meeting with incarcerated youth. So our uh, our driving force is to have hope filled mentors, people that can be so full of hope that they can carry those buckets of hope for the youth until they're strong enough to carry hope for themselves, that uh, you will be able to create those pathways between you and the youth and eventually transfer that hope over to the youth. So thank you for your time today, and I appreciate you. Take care. Bye.